a little bit short for the podium, so just tell me if you if I disappear from view or something, <laughs> which I hopefully shouldn't do. Today's talk, or I should more accurately say workshop, because I'm really looking forward to hearing a lot from you and really participating back and forth quite a bit. Um, the title is called The 21st Century Writer's Toolbox. And I think that this really represents my attitude toward writing when I think about it. Um, really, as a teacher, is that I'm a writer myself, and so I try to come at it from that angle. Now, as a student, I also bring that sort of perspective on writing that I have from um, being a student in an AP Lit class. And I think that I learned a lot of things from this dual experience of both working with students to teach them about writing and being a learner myself. So, you've heard a bit about me. I'd love to hear more about you. Um, can you raise your hand if you're a principal? Any principals in the room? Okay, great. Raise your hand if you're a teacher. Great, lots of teachers. And elementary? Wow, okay, middle? A few people. And high school? Wow, okay. So, I can definitely see um, high school and middle schools will outnumber here <laughs> by elementary. Um, which is an awesome thing. I personally really love working with elementary school students because they're the only ones who, when I'm asking for ideas, everyone is raising their hands and just clamoring to be heard, which I think is a lovely trait. And then for some reason that just goes away as you get older. So hopefully some of the things that we'll talk about here can encourage participation and really motivate students to take part more. Now, one thing that I'd love to hear from you before I um, get started with some of these techniques and such, what are some of the challenges you faced or some success stories you've had, actions you've taken? What anyone would like to share? I can see the hand raising really does go down. <laughs> some brave souls. Yes, I think one challenge is having students get started on their writing. It's like that brain block that they just can't get started. Having students get started on the writing, overcoming the brain block at the beginning, great. And does anyone have a solution that they've used to address that? Talk. Talking, great. So the importance of talking, maybe before getting started with a story or telling students, okay, now it's your job to go do this, maybe discussing it, really having that interaction. And I think that's something very important for me when I am teaching students is that I really try to put myself in their shoes, quite literally. I do a lot of collaborative writing and writing with the students, but I also imagine, okay, I have this assignment or I have this project and I'm about to get started on. How would I feel? What would I write about? And if I feel stuck myself thinking about that, I realize, okay, there's a bit of a problem and I need to work with them. So, I'm going to make this full screen over here. <coughs> One thing that I really love doing is something called being a poison tester, or I should say the poison tester effect. I made it this name because a lot of times I'll see the students, if they hear, okay, we're going to write an essay, we'll get super scared, you know, okay, it's an essay, this is going to kill me, let's just pull an all-nighter. There's this very, like, adversarial relationship with essays, or even sometimes with fictional narratives. It's something that be gotten over. And I think that when teachers really work with students to write in front of them and show, hey, I'm doing this, I'm vulnerable too, it can be incredibly powerful by showing that you as a teacher are actually a writer as well and can be as weak, can be as confused, can be as blocked sometimes as any of them with ideas. And that's incredibly powerful. Um, and showing that also shows that you're not scared to undertake the things that you're asking them to do. So that's something that I really love to do. When I'm asking students to get started on writing their ideas for a personal narrative, for instance, we'll actually choose an idea to work on together, an experience that maybe we all have in common, and then I'll open up a document and start writing. So to demonstrate, I just love to try this with all of you. Um, how about we do a descriptive writing passage, kind of elementary school level perhaps, since that's the majority of people here. So we'll write about a treehouse, an imaginary treehouse. Now, to source ideas for this imaginary treehouse and make sure that we're using good descriptive words, I'd like to ask for your ideas. So what are some adjectives that could describe this treehouse? Just throw out some adjectives. Large. Okay. Enchanted. Enchanted. Rickety. I'm sorry. Rickety. Rickety. Love it. What else? Spider inhabitant. Spider inhabit. Great. What else? Open window. Open windows. Lovely. Starting to see the image of this tree I was you take for. What are some other things? What words are we missing? What about the hmm? Secrets. Great. Hideaway. Hideaway. And what about colors? Any colors that come to mind with this tree house? Tiny. Yellow. Yellow. Brown. Tiny brown. Wooded. 
red, wooded. Great, so we have this list of words and adjectives that can describe the treehouse, and now the question is how do we weave this together in something that makes sense and that really gives the reader an interesting description, a very visual image. So we might start with where it is, it's setting. Um, it's wooded, so is it in the middle of like a really big enchanted forest, or is it in someone's backyard? Okay, raise your hand for enchanted forest. Seeing some raised hands, raise your hand for someone's backyard. Wow, we have some people who like realistic settings here, all right? So, <laughs> a secret garden type of backyard. A secret garden type of backyard. Okay, the backyard is isolated, hidden deep within a nest of uh, crawling tendrils of ivy. Okay, the tendrils is like the right word. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so actually, this is sort of what I mean. Usually, I wouldn't be quite serious about the first sentence, but working with students, I definitely have a lot of thoughts running through my mind. Will they think this is good? Will they think it's boring? Um, will they think, oh, she's not that great of a writer? Why is she teaching us? But that vulnerability <laughs> is incredibly exciting, and it also makes me have some empathy for them and how they might feel, especially some less confident writers. So the backyard is isolated, hidden deep within a nest of crawling tendrils of ivy and towering trees. Um, at the center, perched on the branches of a wide, um, what's the type of tree? Oak. Oak is the treehouse. Okay. Is treehouse supposed to be two? Okay. Uh, Microsoft Word tells me it's supposed to be two different words. <laughs> It could be wrong, yes, that's right. I should not trust Microsoft Word. This could be a opening for propaganda. Okay, that's like really touchy. <laughs> Enchanted, rickety spider inhabits. So, how can, so we can start weaving this in with some sort of transition, or maybe we can um, keep going with this paragraph. Uh, let's see. The beams supporting the walls are rickety, and Infested with spiders. Who? What is what is the characteristic of these spiders? Are they frightening? Are they kind looking? Hostile? Are they creepy. Creepy. Infested with creepy spiders that pop out at mm, in moments. Uh, in moments you think they're gone. Okay, that's a little bit awkwardly phrased, but we can always go back and revise. Two open windows beckon adventurous climbers. So if you want to pop in through those windows. On the inside, the treehouse is a garish yellow color. No offense to this, if you like yellow, by the way. But on the outside, it's the brown color of the trunks of trees. And what else can we incorporate here? From a passing pedestrians, actually you literally have a pedestrian in the middle of, each, in the middle of such a secret garden like that here. But, all right, from passing pedestrians point of view, it looks ordinary. But from yours, it is enchanted. Okay, so there we go. We have this little description of the treehouse. The backyard is in the backyard. The backyard is isolated, hidden deep within a nest of crawling tendrils of ivy and towering trees. At the center, perched on the branches of a wide oak, is the treehouse. The beams supporting the walls are rickety, invested with creepy spiders that pop out in moments you think they're gone. Two open windows beckon adventurous climbers. On the inside, the treehouse is a garish yellow color, but on the outside, it's the brown color of the trunks of trees. Perfect for camouflage. Is that how you spell it? No, that is not. I will trust Microsoft Word on this. Okay, you can see my weakness in the writer right there. From a passing pedestrian's point of view, it looks ordinary, but from yours, it is enchanted. So there we go. Now, I didn't manage to use all the words, but I can continue with this if I want to go into maybe some more um, advanced descriptive writing things, ask students what do the spiders sound like, how could we use onomatopoeia if I really wanted to throw in fancy words. <laughs> um, overall, I think that 
an activity like this really gives students a chance to work together, but it also gives them a chance to see the teacher as a writer and someone who's not scared to put themselves out there and say, okay, we're going to really test the waters here and write ourselves. So that's my opinion of why writing collaborative with students is so awesome, and I love doing it all the time. Now another thing that I've heard mentioned a lot is this idea of creating a community of writers, or um, the way that I, I guess, thought of it was creating a community of editors as well. Because one thing that I've noticed in my own experience with writing is that often I'll write a first draft of an essay and I'll submit it to the teacher, I might get a little bit of feedback, but then it's done with. I don't really do much with it, and it has a readership of one person. To me, that isn't as authentic as the writing that I do, say, for a blog or in a book. And I think that creating a community of writers is also creating a community of editors, allowing students to read other students' writing and give feedback. One way that you can do this really effectively is with something like a wiki or a Google Docs. So then you use technology to try to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer feedback. Seeing a raised hand. Do you want to um, elaborate a little bit? Uh, I just roll. You use, sorry. We, I just roll the wiki command for the Google Docs as well. Awesome, great. So to give an example, um, okay, so like a Google Doc. Probably everyone here seen Google Docs. Okay, I'm seeing some raised hands. Um, probably most of you have, but let's say I'm a student and I started writing, uh, let's say I uploaded my Treehouse Descriptive Passage. Yeah. Okay, Treehouse Descriptive Passage, and I copied this and my list of words here. Now what I could do is I could share it and ask my teacher, I could ask other people in my class to read it, and they could add comments. I could allow them to edit, or I could allow them to comment, or just to view. Now this is a really simple thing, as you can see. It's literally two clicks and you're done. But the great thing about this is that suddenly you can get all these different points of views added on one document. And if a teacher, say, chooses to edit it, then the student can watch them doing it in real time, and really learn the very, essentially about the writing process. Now another great example, especially for discussing, I think, a book or um, any other big projects for students would be something like a wiki. So this is a wiki space that I use for the conference I've organized, TEDx Redmond, but I think it could be used really effectively to um, <laughs> work on a project because you can create all these different pages, people can edit it, and it really allows you to see, okay, who's been writing, who's been editing, and describe the changes. So again, showing that writing process and getting students to practice their typing skills, to practice their computer literacy skills, I feel like it's a lot of things in one. So the wikis and Google Docs are a really essential part of the 21st Century Writer's Toolbox. Now I also want to ask a question, have any of you used social networking in your writing classes? I'm seeing some raised hands, awesome. Would you like to tell us about that? I use social networking, I do not use it in writing classes. Sorry, I wasn't listening to the whole question. Oh yeah, no problem. How do you use social networking otherwise? Um, we have a team of um, coaches in our district and we collaborate a lot together, both socially and professionally. What are you doing for this? How did you solve that problem? And so we put things up, um, share them on a blog or share them on a um, Facebook page so that we can all see what other people are doing or managing or happy birthday or whatever that um, connection needs to be. That's awesome, using it in a professional context. I think the important thing to realize for that is that you use social networking a lot as adults. If you're trying to create a really authentic community of writers, allowing students to tap into a, not quite a professional network, but an educational network, allowing them to see, here's how I make these connections, here's how I can bounce off ideas, can be really powerful. And I think that a lot of times when you hear Facebook or you hear social networking and students, there are sort of alarm bells that go off and, oh no, that seems like a really bad idea. But in my own experience, I've been on Facebook for a little while, and um, I'm going to maybe take a bit of a risk here and bring you to my Facebook page. Uh, so if there's any objectionable content in my newsfeed, it is not my fault. Um, let me bring you to a definitely not objectionable content page. My art history um, class actually has a Facebook group, and this is really common in a lot of high school. Students will set up these groups, especially if they want to complain about what's been going on in class, or they just want to help each other out, post homework, what's been going on for people who are absent. It's been really nifty, and um, it helps a lot because all these questions that otherwise you might be confused by, or you might have to call up a teacher or something, are suddenly answered right here. It's another example. <laughs> The, I was doing Relay for Life with the American Cancer Society, and Facebook was like the key organizing tool. So you see how we're not just using Facebook to spread objectionable content. We're using Facebook to connect with our classes. We're using Facebook to promote the causes we believe in, to organize events, and to all in all really, I think, be better citizens in some ways. Obviously, that's not 
all that we're doing, but I think it is important to realize that this is a key component of most of my peers' uh, social networking experience. So, this might be more appropriate for, say, a high school audience, but let's say that, what is the book you read a lot in high school? Okay, so the great Yahtzee. 1984. Okay, so let's say we have 1984. And you could make it a secret group if you were extremely concerned about privacy. Now, this is something, obviously, you want to make sure that everyone in your house is on Facebook already. If you have people who aren't on Facebook, then maybe like telling them, hey, get on Facebook just for this might not be advisable. But in my experience, pretty much every one of my high schools on Facebook. So if you made a secret group, and then you add friends, so let's say I'll add my mom as an example, just so that I can start this group. Create, and choose an icon, okay. And now suddenly, I can post things, I can add photos or videos, I can ask questions. This is really cool because it allows a lot of students who might not speak up otherwise to really participate. And so maybe I can pose a question. So, um, what is the question you could pose about 1984? I've read it like half a year or so. Okay, question you could pose about 1984. How is it relevant to, to today's society? That's a good one. Okay, how, it, how is um, the message of 19 or... How are the events of 1984 relevant to today's, to events in today's, there we go, post. And then if you were a student, you could comment and say, as an example, um, for instance, there's this news about England having over 1,000 surveillance cameras within Metro London or something like that. Or you could add something about surveillance or you know, there's tons of different examples that could tie in. Now, you can also do this if you're looking for a more secure environment, and one that might be better for elementary school students, say, Edmodo is really awesome. I was recently, I recently had the opportunity to speak to a group of students in Maryland, and one of the really cool things about what they were doing was they were creating a big literary anthology of their work, which I was like, yay, this is a really wonderful, authentic example of how students can be writers, and they're having this big project. But another cool thing is that I had these four video conferences with them, and I had never met any of them in person, but we had this connection through Edmodo, so that when they have questions I can answer, they would often ask really interesting questions about, have you ever had this feeling where you had to give up, or you got really bored of something you're writing? And I'm like, yes, you know, I'm a writer, but I get these feelings all the time. And so you're a writer, even though you might get blocked, uh, you might have um, writer's block sometimes, that's totally normal. And I think that it was really awesome to be able to connect with them, and it taught me a lot, because I saw what is the process going through their mind, how do they feel, what are the things that make them insecure when they're about to share writing with the audience. So this was a really great example of a social network, Edmodo, an educational one being used for writing and for students to build this community. What I really loved was that it wasn't necessarily just me answering the questions all the time. A lot of times, when I would say busy and I would answer maybe for a day or two, then other students would chime in and they would help each other out. And I thought, well, this is really awesome. What if more classes could have something like this, where students could work together, say, here's an idea I'm thinking about. How can I make it more realistic? Or what do you think this character could say, make their dialogue sound more like a friend of yours, or you know, more realistic? Um, what is a descriptive word I could use? There's a lot of, there are a lot of possibilities for students when they have this community, a place to go to, and it also extends their experience with writing outside of the school day. Because a lot of times, I'll hear people say, oh, you know, I do this writing class, but it really doesn't have relevance outside of class. Or, I, after I leave class, I stop writing. And that's something that we should probably try to prevent, because when it comes down to it, writing is a lifelong thing, not just something that you want to do for an hour every day. So, that's an example of social networking, Edmodo, Facebook group. You can ask questions, upload files and links. For instance, if I had this chair's passage, I could bring it to my Edmodo group and say, hey, here's my passage, can you please add comments and tell me what you think. So this would be a really awesome way to create that peer-to-peer -peer interaction, and it's all teacher monitored, so it's really cool. Now, those are just a few of my ideas. Do you have any ideas for how you might use various online tools or social networking in your writing classrooms? VoiceThread, great. Okay, so how, how many people here are familiar with VoiceThread? Seeing some raised hands, great. This is a really nice one because if you think about how a person's voice, um, I, I'm only, a, um, I'm not super familiar with it, but a little bit. Uh, if you think about how important someone's voice is, like when you're giving feedback or 
really anything or to tell a story that can be really awesome as well. Great voice thread, anything else? Any other ideas for online tools in the writing classroom? Yes? What kind of apps are good on, for iPads? What kind of apps are good for iPads? That's a really good question. Um, for iPads, I would say um, if students really like visual learning, um, I use Drawing Pad a lot. I would draw something and then I would take that and try to do a descriptive activity. Um, it depends what level art students. Well, the second language is English, the first language is ASL, so I'm just... It's a bit of a complicated scenario. We'll video them signing and then ask them to put that into English written words. So we use the iPad for signing a story and then their homework is to go home and write about it. Uh, so I'm just wondering how the video and, and the writing can happen on the one iPad. I wonder if there's an app that can help with that or, or anything we can use. It's just a new idea that we're trying at our school. We haven't begun yet, but we're playing around with that. I just wanted to see what kind of apps were out there. That's great. I actually haven't been seeing the iPad as much. Um, I definitely know that there are a lot of great writing apps out there. Actually, um, let me see. Some of the um, Any ideas? You know, taking iPad apps like Penultimate and Notetaker that are all annotated for PDFs can include video um, and embed that in along with the notes of the PDF for a lot of those apps. Okay, so some of the note taking apps. Great. Springpad is one that I've seen use um, with kids where she's conferring, and this is just along the lines of the videoing, where they'll video conferences with kids um, and then take notes about the student's reading performance at that time, you certainly can do it around writing. But when the teacher is tied up and can't, she'll have the student conference with the iPad, and then the teacher can later watch what the student did, and then they can confer about it the next day. So using that video to make sure the contact stays there, even though the teacher might have to confer with too many people. Great. All amazing ideas. Any other? Yes? Dragon Diction is a good one from the Reluctant Writer. It's a, it's a great of um, the mechanics of writing because they can see in their ideas. It will record it for them and type it out, and then they can go back into the edit. What was that again? Dragon Diction. Oh, okay. Definitely. I've actually experimented with that a couple times. For some reason, it, I don't know, when I, when I say the word Rob Dignagy, which is one of my favorites, I never quite gets that exactly right. <laughs> Everything else that usually works pretty well. So there's actually one more technology I suppose I should talk about that was really influential for me. I was in school for many years when I was younger, and a big part of my writing was that we would set up these blogs, and so actually I should go to my blog and show you kind of the archive, uh, let's see, 2005, when I first started writing. So our teacher, Felisa, would give us these assignments where we would become an expert on various topics, and we got to choose what topic we wanted. So I chose ancient China. And I would write these nonfiction articles about all these really interesting things that I would find. And I felt like it made me a better writer because suddenly I was exploring nonfiction, which I had been really weary of before, but I was also exploring history, which was a really cool uh, connection there. So let me see if I can find one of those becoming an expert ones. Now, another great thing was that people from around the world were starting to weigh in on my blog, which was pretty incredible for me because I was just like eight years old, and I didn't think that anyone really cared what I, an eight-year-old in Redmond, Washington State, cared to say about ancient China or really much of anything, and uh, people were commenting. That was incredibly motivating for me as a writer. When I knew that people were tuning in or seeing what I had to say, I thought, how can I make my writing better? How do I make it more interesting for them? And sometimes people would actually give me comments. They would say, hey, you might want to go to this website to find better resources about China, or you know, this fact is maybe incorrect, actually, I think about that once or twice. Um, it made me more investigative, it made me evaluate websites better, it made me more careful of my grammar and spelling because I was suddenly thinking, okay, this is how people are evaluating me, so I need to make sure that I am respecting their time. So, let's see if I can find, sorry, my blog is kind of epic. I'm trying to find a, um, let's see, when did it become an expert one? Okay, well, here's a school assignment that I did. It's really tiny, I'm sorry. So we read Shine, Perishing Republic by Robinson Jeffers. Oh, I've not read this in a while. This is a really long time ago, 2007. And so this is something I wrote. 
I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And now, for, to most of you, this might look like an average evaluation of a poem, something that your students would write. But for me, it really gave me meaning because I thought, okay, how do I make this interesting, not just for my teacher's eyes, not just something that will get an A, but something that people in Indonesia who saw me on TV will want to read, something that people in England who read about me in newspaper will be interested in reading if they like poetry and they like doing evaluations of poetry. So I think it definitely allowed me to consider that my writing wasn't just for one other person, the teacher. Uh, it wasn't even just for my classmates, that it was for the world. So when it comes to giving students the chance to be authentic writers, providing an authentic audience is key. How many of you allow your students to share their work or give regular opportunities for students to share their work with their class? Seeing a lot of raised hands, great. What about with the entire school? Okay, seeing some a few less. So if you're a little bit worried about, okay, putting students on a blog, I'm sure that there's district policy against that, very well might be, you could make a blog that would be private to, say, um, students in your school. And I think that even making it larger than just a class can be really important. In the example of that class that I talked to in Maryland, they created this literary anthology, and it truly made my day to see that, because I saw how their work had developed, how they had changed certain things. This is the same group that was on the Edmodo page. Um, these lovely students at Vincent Farm. And just to show you a little example of what their writing looked like. So these were some fourth grade students. Let's see how this will load all right. So this was their anthology that they created. Literary magazine, and they printed this out. They distributed copies to their classmates and to other students in the school. They also included a lovely picture and some quotation marks. And this was really part of my day dedicated to Adora Sweet Opera, inspiration, cheerful guidance, which taught us all that we have it in us to be an author, which I thought was really amazing of them because also another one of the stories behind this video conference was that again and again, technology issues had come up, things had gone wrong. In some ways, even though I evangelize using technology to such an extent, I may be the worst person for it because every single time uh, I, I did a video conference with these students, the video conferencing system had problems. And yet, through all, through all this adversity, we kept on persisting, we kept on creating stories, and these are a few of the things that they wrote. So, this one reminds me a lot of my writing. This is Regina's Impressive Illustration of Fantasy. Lovely title there. So once upon a time, there lived a Pegasus named Gazelle, and she was very lonely. She was so lonely that when she flew, she left no rainbow trail, unlike the beautiful rainbow trails of other Pegasuses. Her home was an abandoned sanctuary, and she had no mom or dad to care for her. And I started reading these stories, and I was so impressed with the trips through their imaginations that I was able to take, because as a 14-year-old, probably a lot of you have had this experience. As you grow up, you think, okay, that's a stupid idea. I won't write about that. That's too crazy. That's too fantastical. And so to see this, to go back and really have that experience was really incredible for me. I think that they taught me a lot, um, perhaps more than I taught them even. So when I think about how this audience for them made a huge difference when they knew that I would be reading it, when they knew that their fellow classmates would be reading it, and how it drove a lot of them who might not have otherwise thought, okay, I need to really cross every T and dot every I to do so, I was incredibly impressed. And I think that this is really a testament to the power of an authentic audience and that bigger leadership. So to go back to the present. <laughs> and what are some other ideas? So there's a literary magazine idea, there could be an Edmodo group. What are some other ways that you could give students that authentic audience? One student published on Teen Inc. Teen Inc., great. So websites where teenagers can submit work. Okay, Teen Literary Magazine website, this is a really good one, especially for high school students. Another one is that you can, it does have advertisements, which I suppose is an unfortunate thing, at least they're for Chase Bank. Um, not for you. So, um, you can encourage students to submit to websites like Teen Inc. Another one is you can encourage students to submit to Cricket, Cicada, Stone Soup, all the magazines which accept student writing. I think that this brings to mind another important thing, which is when students ask, why am I doing this? The answer of because this technique will be on the state test or because you're going to use it 20 years from now is often not satisfying enough 
for even I love writing. I want to know why I'm writing this essay, why I'm writing this poem sometimes. So to give students an idea that what they're writing will go somewhere. It could go to the magazine, it could go to their classmates, it's an incredibly motivating factor. Um, I, I would also say that I know that you're not supposed to like get politics or argument maybe as much in the classroom, but ask the students write to your elected officials about a thing that you really, really care about, um, or writing a, a letter, say, if you could write to President Obama, or perhaps taking a side in an argument. You know, those are things that got me writing quite a lot when I was younger, maybe because I was a bit more politically oriented. So, writing this blog and having the comments also really put me in touch with a lot of writers around the world, which I think is an incredible thing. So it really gives students the chance to see I can be at an equal level with J.K. Rowling or with any of these other writers and really aspire to be like them. Um, that's really empowering. So allowing students opportunities to have their work published is something I would really advocate. So if we go back over um, wikis and Google Docs, VoiceThread, and Moto, Facebook, I think that there's one common thread, which is that they all build a network. They all build a community. And I think that showing students that writing isn't something that really happens within a bubble. You're not just, you know, solitary writer with your one idea that it can really be a community effort, a collaborative effort, doing this by modeling it, and collaborating with students, the whole poison tester effect of writing stories together can truly be incredibly effective. So I would love to hear some more success stories from all of you. What are some things that have worked? What are some books that your students have really loved to read? So, books your students have really loved to read. Why don't <coughs> Hunger Games. Hunger Games, yes, one of my favorites. Awesome. Which one? Divergent. Divergent, okay. And any others? Westlandia. Westlandia? Oh, I've heard about that. I haven't read it, though. Any others? The Lightning Thief series. The Lightning Thief series? Great. Now, what was... Is there anything in common kind of with all these books, aside from really compelling storylines and maybe young characters, I guess, that are relatable? The fact that they're a series, so it gives them books to read. Series? Okay. Now, how many of you allow students to have some say in the books that are being read in a given semester? Seeing some raised hands, great. So how do students work out which ones to decide? Is it a vote or do they nominate certain books? brings to mind a really another interesting idea. So let's say you take a book that's really popular, like the popular, like The Hunger Games, and you ask the students, how about you create a fan page for this book? You can invite some of your fellow students to, and you can talk about why do you like this book so much? How might you convince someone who's like, oh, I won't read The Hunger Games, it sounds so violent and nasty. How would you convince them to read it that has a really good story? What are some common things that you like about the book? Really getting students to elaborate beyond, I love this book so much, can be difficult, I've seen, um, but asking them to start a fan page or write an editorial, write a book review, not, not a book report, I think that could be super influential. What else? What are some other ideas that you have? Is it okay if it's only at a second grade level? Yes, of course. Um, I uh, participated in a writing class with some of the people in this room, and we did the important book, which is a book that is, the important thing about a spoon is that it's hollow. You eat with it, it's something, it's something, but the important thing about a spoon is that you eat with it. And so I read that aloud to kids, and we talked about what the author was doing, and we looked at the sentence structure, and for second graders, they had no problem recreating their own important thing, and the ideas that they come up with are amazing, even if it is... The important thing about a feather is that it's light. You can blow it and it will fly across the room, but the important thing about a feather is that it's light. I mean, that's a one-liner, that's all that student had to come up with, but now they have a poem that they feel amazingly successful for, and so we published that in an anthology of sorts, 
and shared it back with those kids. And I did the same activity in fifth grade, and I got better writing from the second graders. Wow. Wow. So that's, that's really powerful. I think that it goes to show something as well about how students can be really self-limiting sometimes. Um, we can definitely be our own worst enemies. Maybe if you saw me sort of writing the Patriots ideas, there are probably a thousand other places I could have taken it, but I was thinking, okay, what will work best? You know, and sometimes it's that um, amount of perfectionism or that thinking, what will other people think of me that can narrow that writing so it doesn't have that same, I guess, beauty of the second graders. What are some ways that we can help preserve that creativity? Well, one thing I think we need to do is not to tell kids, well, you can't write that. Right? Okay. Let me correct your spelling. Let me pull out my red pen. You've got to have a period here. You've got to have a capital right. here. Um, you need to go back and look that up. Let that stuff go for a long time and get the ideas out there so that anything goes, anything flies, and then you pick one thing out of your exploration and you're playing around. And I'm a fantastic speller like yourself. And um, <laughs> I love the fact that there's a computer so that nobody knows that I still can't spell the word benefit. So they saved my life. There's an E in the middle, I think. Or sometimes there's an I, it depends. Um, and I think letting kids just write for the sake of telling the story instead of writing for the sake of spelling things correctly. Because spelling does not go. Can I say something? Yeah, sure. This is my mom, by the way. <laughs> Hi. I can absolutely agree with you here. Um, that's how we helped Adora. And uh, we never told her anything about you can't do. It's always about just get your ideas. And uh, uh, I used to tell Adora, actually, you should tell a story about the tall tale stories that we'll always ask the kids to tell us in the car ride. And uh, that's how she got into telling stories. And, uh, and this no story is too bizarre or too strange or not correct. And also agree with you about you know, overcorrecting kids at early age. The most important thing is the love for writing, love to share ideas. And everything else can be fixed very easily. And later. Yes. And later. Yes. Definitely. No, I experienced some of that. I um, was teaching this class, I think it was in New York State a while ago. And I found myself getting a little bit really terrified of the ideas they were coming up with. Long story short, we were writing a poem about a ninja attacking a dragon, and the ninja had issues with bladder control when frightened. And that was our <laughs> Now I was thinking, oh my goodness, what will the teacher think? Will I be forever banned from speaking in the school again? Are the students going to go home and tell their parents about this, and they'll be shocked at how vulgar and terrible this is? But I, was then, I then thought, well, you know what, the fact that these fifth graders actually are comfortable enough with speaking about this issue and not like dissolving in the giggles every single time for a while, even. But um, the fact that they also see that poetry can literally be about anything that you want it to be, that it's not just the domain of dead old men from the 15th century, you know, that was the most powerful thing I think that we drew from that day. And I think that as, as a writer and a teacher, I felt like I have to take myself less seriously sometimes because in all of, I've been reading so many classics and I feel like I have to be exactly like Charles Dickens or something. And that's like the worst way of starting writing, I think, um, trying to put yourself into that mold. So really good point. I think that emphasizing the content, the idea, as opposed to the form, there's the structure can be incredibly important. What are some other ways we can preserve creativity? As a staff um, at Inglewood Elementary, we've been working this year a lot on inquiry writing and allowing students to look at a genre of books, of, of, of text, and figuring out their own understanding through the lens of an author. And what, what does nonfiction writing look like? And having the students come up with what nonfiction is, and then using their ideas, their inquiry that we engaged in as a class collaboratively, to then drive the writing instruction in the class. Great. So giving them that ownership piece um, and that tie-in to, to what they're doing. Giving students ownership? Great. Now, how many of you would say that all of your students call themselves writers? All of your students call themselves writers? A few people. Okay, so that's a really major part, I think. Making sure that every single student uh, feels that they're a writer. It is a writer. It doesn't have to, you know, you can emphasize. Being a writer doesn't mean that you have this, like, insane personality or that you write every single minute, but it just means really being invested in your writing, caring about writing, 
And I think that that's one issue is that a lot of times students feel like writing is something I do, but it's not something I am. It's not part of my identity. So really giving students that ownership can be a major component of that. What are some other ideas? Because really I feel like reciprocal learning is such a big part of it. I, one of the reasons I was super excited about coming to a writing conference like this, or writing a teaching conference like this, was to be in a room with people like you and to be able to hear your ideas. So please do speak up. struggling writers, and they're in middle school, and I had them do a project where they created their own country, and they needed to draw it, so that helped a lot of students, because that's where their talent was. Mm -hmm. And then they were able to write some paragraphs describing it around. That's awesome. That, that actually brings to mind, um, when I was also younger, we had this activity, the imaginary country one. Um, I came up with one uh, called Dinanoc. I'm not sure where that name came from, but we actually turned our entire classroom into this imaginary nation, and our teacher was the dictator because we decided that it was an oppressive regime that we'd have to overthrow. We were like really zealous seven and nine year olds. Um, and then we actually did overthrow her when she left the room. We walked her out and then declared our independence by writing the manifesto. Now, this was all completely unplanned, and I think that she might have been pretty mad at us while she was locked out, but when we showed her our manifesto of independence, um, she, I think, realized what a cool thing we had done, and that is the type of thing, that is the type of writing that I think students can produce when, you know, there's there are those organic moments. Obviously, I'm not saying all of you should um, suddenly give your students the opportunity to overthrow you, but it made us really think about hierarchy, it is about government, and you know, most seven-year-olds probably generally don't put overthrowing an oppressive regime on the top of their priority list for the day, but that was ours, and it made us produce some pretty awesome writing. So creating your own country, really encouraging students to tap into their visual learning by creating drawings, that's what we did as well. We made some really awesome flags and lots of propaganda materials. It was really fun. Um, creating your own country, what are some other ideas, other projects? Yes. Well, I think that a lot of the, the ideas that we've heard are student behaviors, but I also think it's really important for teachers to lighten up a little bit yeah. mm -hmm. and be more accepting of maybe those out-of-the-box ideas that students have and not be quite so judgmental. Right, like not being judgmental. I mean, that was the moment that I had. Like, I had to restrain myself from saying, no, we can't write about this ninja, and that was the idea. And I feel like letting it go and really understanding the value of it was a cool moment for me. So teachers should lighten up. What else? Yes? I'm kind of going along with that. Um, I teach third grade, and where we teach, like, the kids don't always have a lot of life experiences. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when they get stuck in, like, um, personal narratives, they're like, well, it has to be about some magical trip or some really cool event in their life. And you can write about just going to the park or going to Fred Meyers. And um, we read Tales of the Fourth Grade Nothing. I think that was a really good example of just how he writes about his life and his little brother. And so just to show them that you can write a story about just getting up in the morning, and it can be a good story that you can still have value. Great, making the magic out of the mundane can be an incredible skill. As, actually, as a great example of that, since I, um, I taught a group of students about personal narrative one time, and I asked, so, oh, have you traveled anywhere? Have you taken a nice trip? And a lot of them hadn't gone out of, this, out of the state, and a few hadn't actually really gone much further than their town. So I thought, okay, how do we take a common experience that seems really boring? And one of the examples was choosing between flavors of ice cream. And so choosing between flavors of ice cream is generally not a life or death decision, unless you're in some really weird ice cream parlor. And I asked students, OK, what, in the few seconds that you're staring at the two flavors of ice cream, what is going through your head? What are the feelings? And students came up with this list of words. It included things like, I think there was even like stressed out, and um, pulse was like fast pulse, something else. Actually, why don't we try this here? What are some other words? What would come into your mind? How do you feel as you're looking eagerly between two different types of ice cream? Mouth watering. Mouth watering. Gray? Hungry. Hungry. Anxious. Anxious. Too many points. Oh, sorry. Too many points means it's high in weight watcher points. Too many points. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Too many calories. Maybe. I, actually, it's kind of frightening um, when uh, elementary school students can be 
was thoroughly aware of that. Um, yeah. Anything That's else? And like what I'll miss out on. Anticipatory. And uh, anticipatory, maybe like regretful yes. a tiny bit, or wistful because you want both. So how do things make us listen to words? And then we write these uber dramatic pieces where it's like, you know, I tell them it's okay to dramatize a little bit, even though it's personal so scary, you can make this really exciting. So This is a really, this is really gross, so I'm about to say that. <laughs> I figured I need to let it go, right? And that was what came to mind. Reminiscent of summer days, what are some other good memories you would think of from strawberries? And family gatherings. There was that alluring tub, chocolate tub. What a funny <laughs> word to describe. Carton of chocolate? What, what is the word? Tub. Tub, okay, good. Tub of chocolate ice cream. How would you describe chocolate? Decadent. 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 <laughs> okay, so, so now you can ask the students, maybe they can even take a vote. Which, which flavor should we choose? How do we make this more exciting? How do we up the ante? So maybe there's, you, it's like you have one second. How do you feel now? So really getting students to I feel the suspense and to realize that this is a really mundane activity, you know, choosing between two flavors of ice cream, who feels like that? But the thing is that everyone can feel like that in that, you know, split second, two seconds or whatever. You can have that little racing pulse and the looking back and forth and kind of weighing your options, so. dramatic expression of a sailor on a sinking ship <laughs> grasping a lifeboat. Wait, grasping a life jacket. I don't know why I thought it would just be like that. Maybe. You could ask students to come up with a better simile. I'm sure they would have lots and lots of ideas. Um, <coughs> chocolate, I declared breathlessly, confident choice. But before we left the store, I did look back wistfully once <laughs> at that beautiful tub of strawberry. Okay, we're strawberry ice cream, I can say. So, we wrote that in like, what, two minutes? Three minutes? However long that took. My eyes dart between the two flavors of ice cream, my pulse racing, strawberry, chocolate, strawberry, chocolate. Hurry up, my brother yelled. I wanted to yell back, but I had a decision to make. I was hungry, my mouth watered, my tongue dripping with anticipation. On one hand, I was anticipating that cool, sweet, strawberry flavor reminiscent of summer days and family gatherings. But there was that alluring tub of chocolate ice cream, definite and comforting. Finally, I threw open the freezer door and grabbed a tub of chocolate with the dramatic expression of a sailor on a sinking ship grasping a life jacket. Chocolate, I declared breathlessly, confident in my choice. But before we left the store, I did look back at the one, so that beautiful tub of strawberry ice cream. <laughs> so, mundane experience turning into something dramatic, turning it into something that has all the, you know, melodramatic stuff of maybe not life and death, but, you know, pretty close. That's actually a really cool challenge. Ask students, how do you make a decision between two flavors of ice cream as dramatic as someone who's made no labor or death decision, you know, 
I feel like um, that's a super important component of writing, being able to turn the mundane into the magical. All right, so let's get one more idea for our list of best practices, because this is literally what I take from the conferences and incorporate into my thinking, so let's have a look. I think even implementers have already published authors, so if they like a certain genre of writing, then show them some examples of people who have done it before. Great. Getting published authors and mentors? Wonderful. I know this can be really exciting for author visits. Um, when Christopher Cowley, he wrote Aragon, um, that whole Inheritance trilogy, he visited a local library. Unfortunately, I missed him, which I was really missed about. But I know that so many people turned out to see him. And so writers can be like celebrities, especially right after you read someone's work. All right, so we have this list, letting errors go, emphasizing the ideas instead of the form, telling a story for the sake of telling a story, telling tall tales to promote that imagination, making sure that creativity doesn't diminish as we get older, inquiry writing, looking at a genre of books, figuring out interpretation in the lens of an author, really giving students ownership, making every single student feel like they are a writer, and allowing them membership into a writing network with their students, with their uh, fellow students, with their peers. Creating um, someone's uh, their own country, drawing, writing, descriptive paragraphs, making a flag, you know, going through all the motions of being a country, maybe even writing a declaration of independence. Teachers should lighten up and be more accepting of out of the box ideas, emphasizing that you can write a story about those seemingly mundane experiences, and getting published authors to be mentors in your classroom with students who are really big fans. Great, so we have this list, we have some of our tools to use, whether it's something as simple as Facebook, or you can set up an Enmodo, or a Wiki, all of these things are free, so that's really the great thing, and all of them have privacy controls, even with something like Blogger, you can set it up to be specific to just these people with just these email addresses. Um, and I think that this is really one of the cool things, is that I as a writer, I feel like I would not be standing here today, I wouldn't have the opportunity to publish my books or really take my writing much further if I hadn't, from an early age, had many of the things that we discussed about. This authentic network and the chance to see writers as mentors, the chance to really hear from my peers about my writing. So, you never know if the students walking in your classes might be able to really reach new heights, and I'm sure that you all know that every day. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I'd be happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? Adora, how, um, how often do you find, as you think about yourself as a writer, looking at those examples, like not just meeting with an author, but looking at examples of what they've written, and how does that help you to make decisions about what you write? That's a really good question. Looking at examples of what other authors have written has really shaped my writing a lot, I would say. Um, especially as I was growing up, because I was such a huge fan of like J.K. Rowling's books and also C.S. Lewis, I would write very, I write about lots of wizards and witches and um, castles. I would go for this very sort of medieval historical setting actually quite a lot. Um, I think that a lot of the early influence was reflected in my writing, but more specifically as a student, seeing those examples of writers and what they've written was, I think, incredibly motivating. Another thing is, this is a really strange one, but seeing examples of really famous writers and having the opportunity to say, I really don't like this, was motivating. We looked at a poem by, I think it was William Carlos Williams, or no, it was um, Wallace Stevens. Um, actually, maybe I can find it. And this is an example of, an Usually we treat, we treat poets and we treat writers like they're kind of sacred almost, like you don't say bad things about this classic because it is a classic. But we were really given this opportunity and Wallace Stevens wrote this poem, uh, it had, well, let's see, it might have been this one. Oh, here we go. This is The Houses Are Haunted by White Nightgowns, none are green or purple with green rings or green with yellow rings or yellow with blue rings. None of them are strange, with socks of lace and beaded centers. People are not going to dream of baboons and periwinkles. Only here and there, an old sailor, drunk and asleep in his boots, catches tigers in the right weather. So we read this all at Stephen's home, and my sister and I, we were at like seven and nine, we were like, what? Is this a poem? Really? Seriously? This guy is famous? And we were just completely aghast, because we were like, we would never write anything like this. But then, of course, our, our um, project was to write a poem in the style of Wallace Stevens. So I wrote something about, um, I think it was rabbits dancing around, and 
they are not wearing dimity nor damask, the type of fabric, um, nor calico. They are also not wearing cotton or cotton blend with wool or something because I was just like so annoyed with this or this with that or the point being that being able, okay, so that was a sort of long-winded answer to your question about seeing examples. But when we saw an example of something, we were able to take issue with it, to point out things that we didn't like, or that we were confused by, taking away that kind of, I guess, sacred nature of this famous poet and everything, um, really debate it, and write in style so that we could better understand maybe how it might be even tough to write a poem like that, which might come across as easy. It gave me the chance to really feel like a writer, have ownership over that, and I think, um, maybe form a more of a unique style, even if you're copying others. So, yeah, great experience. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> so, you are a very quiet bunch. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I'm really sorry. I have learned a lot from all of your ideas, and I hope that you will maybe take some of the ideas about using technology, social networking, really building those student writer networks to your classrooms and maybe tell your colleagues. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. She's wonderful. Um, you know, Dora's been on many, many TV interviews, and she speaks very passionately about what she believes in and literacy and teaching children. And we're thrilled to have her speak again this morning. Welcome, Dora.